Hi, everybody. We're here with a friend, Richard Whitehurst, to talk about mythic story structure and viewing life from the perspective of a waking dream. Thanks, Richard, for joining us. So um, I had a question. I noticed that in our talks that um, for you, perceptions of mythic story structure or perceptions of living a waking dream or dream are almost synonymous to you two types of these two types of what we could call perceptions of our the narrative of our lives so i'm wondering is that an accurate have i accurately picked that up and um what is it about these two perceptions that make them so similar and by thinking this way, do you find you open yourself up to more possibilities in your life? Do you feel energized by viewing your life like this? Can you tell us, you know, something about these things? Okay, we'll give it a go. Um, well, for me, um, I, I think since probably about the early, maybe mid-1990s, I took on board this idea of, of living life as a waking dream. Um, somewhat based, well, based in a few different um, orientations. One was um, that I began to do a lot of my own dream interpretation, and I began to notice that if I considered what was unfolding before me in the so-called outer world in waking life, that in the same way that night dreams have a type of meaning that can be extracted or can be understood, in one, say, inner, inner process, that I was beginning to see that the outer events could also be interpreted symbolically and that, um, that the same kind of meaning could be extracted from what was unfolding in the outside world. Right in front um, of me. Wow. Right in front of me, yeah. And I, there was um, a reference to uh, a book that was written by a Tibetan guru back uh, this is about a thousand years ago, I think, Atisha, and he said of the seven methods of mind control, one of, well, he said the most powerful one was to view all phenomena as a dream. And uh, so I started kind of considering that. I had noticed actually in many uh, spiritual traditions this idea that, that life was like a dream. We were like in a waking dream. And in the same way that one might consider uh, the idea of lucid dreaming, which is like when you're yeah. dreaming at night and you realize, you, you come to conscious awareness, you're, you are dreaming. Uh, and in that, that way, you can start to kind of direct your dreaming and you can be involved in exactly what you're dreaming. So simultaneously, in a waking dream, you can kind of start to consciously be involved where, yeah. where power becomes conscious, where your capacity to... Uh, to act, your willingness wow. and ability to act. Can That's be. really fascinating what you're describing because I, I've had that experience of lucid dreaming and the power of it, you, mm. even within yourself, you know, that you find within yourself to direct the dream. So it's fascinating to think of doing that in your outer life, in your daily life. Yeah. Yes, and for, for anyone who's had a lucid dream experience, they can see it's a quite a different uh, element and characteristic when you're aware of it and you can start to actually interfere or in, involve yourself in the creative venture. Right. So the same is true in the so-called outer world. I keep saying so-called because as you live yeah. life as a waking dream, you start to have the realization that there is no real difference between the outer and the inner. There is a, there is a unity and so it's just a sort of a convenience to say that's outer, and when I close my eyes and look within, that's inner. But there, you see that through the primacy of consciousness, there's this very um, clear um, unity between the two, even though there seems to be a difference um, in conventional thinking. And bringing so. them, bringing uh, it's it's out, and then bringing them both when you see that the outer real are what we think is a tangible life as a dream and then the dream is a dream you can you start controlling both well i don't know if i would use the word controlling but you can you can participate more consciously in what's unfolding and um you can um 
feel a greater vitality and greater meaning in what is happening in your own you know, life of, what, 70 or 80 years or whatever it may be. I like the quote by uh, Schopenhauer that the mythologist um, David, uh, David Joseph Campbell uh, was fond of quoting, which he said, Schopenhauer is saying, when you look back on your life, once you've reached a you know, mature age and you look back on your life, you can see it, it seems to, everything seems to have been placed there intentionally, as though written by some novelist. It, it all has, it forms a, a very uh, um, coherent story. I'm going to ask our next question. Okay. Um, the scholar Mersha Eliade observed that for people to have meaningful lives, they must put their lives into a narrative, a story, a myth. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? And in your work with people over the past 20 years, have you found this to be true for them or helpful in your um, working with people? Okay, well, when I hear that statement, um, the word must comes up for me as, uh, I don't know if people must do it, but I think a lot of people, uh, I think most people do do it. Some of them do it unconsciously, and some of them do it consciously. Mm. And um, I would sort of advocate that one consciously put their, their life into a narrative, um, but not to, uh, to understand that there is a way of being that is also beyond narrative what I refer to as post-narrative, where it, which is a much more being-focused um, being. Well, focused. that's really that's really fascinating because you, you know I I often hear people this the idea of giving a narrative to your life, making sense of it, helps us to perhaps uh, gain perspective, cope, different things. But what's a post-narrative? This is I've never heard of that before. Well, it is, it is um, a way of falling back within oneself where there is no story. There's just pure being. And um, I would say that's like the sort of the essential nature of the self, so that we are in a story and that story is unfolding. Perhaps there is a bigger aspect of ourself that is actually scripting that, you know, where you say, why did that happen to my life? But, and, and that's what I believe, that there is a, a larger aspect um, that is writing the whole story of our lives. And we are, you know, just like when you're dreaming at night, where's, where are the dreams coming from? And so I like to think that, um, I like the idea of Joseph Campbell's monomyth that he writes about in his first really significant published book, which was called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. I think that came out in 1949, where he speaks, he describes what he calls the monomyth, and that is the really most basic breakdown, structural breakdown of mythic um, exposition. And that is that the first part of it is a separation from the world. The second part is a penetration to some source of power uh, where one finds a type of treasure. Think of Jason and the Golden Fleece where he goes into the underworld and then he finds the Golden Fleece. The third element being um, a life-enhancing return where the gifts that are found in the underworld or wherever are brought out into society to make it a better world. And this was something that I began observing in the early 90s. Um, so I'd already, already had familiarity with that book since uh, probably the late 70s. And then I saw this in my clients, because I do a lot of trance work with my clients, where they would separate from the world. So they would you know, go into a hypnotic, you know, altered state of consciousness. They would penetrate into some place of power, call it the creative unconscious, the deep inner mind, whatever you want to call it. There they would find gifts. They would find some sort of treasure that had been lost. And then they would make this return to the outer world, bringing that treasure, and it was life-enhancing, and it would enable them to do good in the world, either for themselves, for their immediate family members, or for broader society. And this is kind of interesting in that it kind of connects to something that I, someone, I don't remember where, but somewhere on Facebook a few months ago, I saw this um, statement that the meaning of life is to find your gift. 
the purpose of life yeah. is to give it away. Yeah, and I thought, yeah, that really encapsulates this whole view. Um, and, and so that's really the element, I think, for myself in my own life, I separated from the world. Well, everyone in one sense seems to separate from the world out of that primal um, uh, state of magic that the child experiences where they are fully embedded in the beingness of the world. And then as language comes in, you know, by the age six or seven, they are feeling that separation, you know, and then into the angst of teenage years. And by the time we're adults, the whole world, as, as Terence McKenna puts, the whole world has been tiled over with language. Um, you know, so what, what you have, you know, you have a child and you have all of this magical experience that's unfolding within the, the awareness of the child and they see this fluttery little thing and the adult is saying, baby, that's a bird. Can you say bird, right? So the, that magical reality of what's there in, in the perception of the child suddenly becomes a word and then it becomes reduced and the whole of reality and then they, they feel this separation. So in one sense, we all separate you know, as we are growing up and as we are taking on board language and starting to you know, mosaic, make a mosaic of the world with a bunch of words. So we are separated. And I like his statement that the first virtual reality is the reality of culture, is, is culture. Culture is the first virtual reality. We're separated. So and in another way, and then I also, when I was, uh, goodness, uh, I had just turned 18, I separated from the world, from society. I became a monk and entered into this, you know, intense sort of yoga practice that was very uh, transcendentally oriented. So it, you know, to, to transcend the world and it was a very strong uh, component of renunciation. Mm -hmm. So there was a more sort of direct separation in that way as well. Um, so what I'm hearing is that uh, one of the questions I had was if you found that um, it's reassuring for people to think in, the, in these terms, or does it represent something more than that? And what I'm hearing you saying is that it represents something more than that. It, um, so does it confirm for something for you about the nature of reality and yourself? Okay. Um, so could you ask the first part of that? There were a couple well, of yeah, questions. Well, yeah, there were two questions. One is that um, I, was, I was wondering if it's, just something that's reassuring to ourselves to think in terms of mythic story structure, how I could be the hero, heroine of my journey, um, uh, or that I'm living a waking dream. It's not, it's more, it's beyond just reassuring to us. In other words, is what I'm hearing you say, it represents something more. And so I'm wondering, does thinking along these terms confirm something to you? or for you about the nature of reality and the self? Well, in years of doing uh, sort of deep trance work with countless clients, I, I have, you, you come up with these various metaphysical perspectives and it seems like from all of the experiences I've had with clients, there is a kind of purpose to one's life that one is born into this world in order to accomplish things, uh, to, in order to address certain aspects of this realm, because this is a very limited, limiting kind of experience to be uh, experiencing life as a human being. It's a lot of restrictions, a lot of limitations, a very vulnerable, um, you know, it's a, a fragile kind of circumstance that um, they seem to, people seem to be born in order to address um, the realms of love, uh, to address uh, power, to address um, relationships, to address masculine, say, and feminine uh, components of this experience to um, understand limitation and to break free of limitation. I had a very strange experience when I was uh, 16. Um, and this is just, a, this will tie in kind of my sin, I think I've told you this one. Um, I was 16. I was on a surfing trip up the east coast of the U.S. Uh, I was in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, staying at a friend's summer cottage. And above their garage, they had a guest room. And myself and a couple of other friends, surfing buddies, we were there. And one night, pardon? No, no, go ahead. 
Yeah. And so one night in the middle of the night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I um, got up out of bed. So I was in that sort of somnambulistic state, walked over to the window, one of those, you know, with the window panes, leaned up against the panes, putting one hand, each hand on, on a separate pane. And then the word freedom just like exploded in my awareness and I took my left hand and smashed it through the glass pane. I cut it quite badly, gripped my, made a fist of that hand and went back to sleep. I woke up in a pool of blood, right, just covered in blood, pale, and, you know, I went to the hospital and had stitches. It was a pretty good little, you know, gash on my hand. Now, about a year ago, I had someone suggest on Facebook that I friend, befriend a particular young genius kind of guy. And on that, on his page, he has, a, 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 he's posted a, a music clip, like a YouTube clip of a group. Um, and the group is called Bloodstained Child. And the song that he's posted is Freedom. Now, I had not made the connection at the time, but I listened to the song and I go, oh, well, I really like the whole energy of this group and their, their expression. And I get their album and um, I just, I'm listen. I play through that album. Goodness, I must have listened to it a hundred times. Just loved it. And then it dropped in Bloodstained Child and Freedom, those two uh, aspects which were so significant. The, once I'd had that experience, the word freedom was just, it was just always very, very strong in my thinking. And I'm always asking myself, am I exploring the, the uh, aspect of freedom, you know, my freedom? And, and I think, you know, once you separate from the world, once you have that separation from the world, there is a consideration about like, yeah, am I, am I constricted now and am I actually free or am I uh, cut off and in some sort of dream? Uh, and I think when I was about 17, a year or so later, I was sitting on a surfboard off Deerfield Beach in Florida, and, and I had this insight that I was looking at that fishing pier just sitting waiting for waves, legs dangling over the, over the board. And as I looked at that fishing pier, everything became like a dream. And I had not been using any drugs or anything. It was just like it, it, it's. I was going to ask you like, on the earlier incident you were using drugs to put your hand through. And no, you, oh no, no. The nurse that sewed me up on that Sunday morning said, "What were you doing?" And she didn't believe me. I just said, "This is what happened." But uh, so I was sitting on that surfboard. I looked out, and it seemed like everything was this strange, dreamlike uh, illusion. There was a, it, it was an illusion of tangibility, but the actual tangibility of everything was, and a very interesting thing about it is that the characteristics of that experience seem much more real than my ordinary ah. waking awareness where I was taking everything to be really, really tangible. And you consider that, you know, from the perspective of physics, uh, from the perspectives of atomic structure, uh, even, and I think it's the Heart Sutra in the Buddhist uh, tradition, they talk about form is emptiness and emptiness is form. And you think about what an atom is, and you know, we have these ideas of atomic structure from our high school chemistry books, you know, and, you know an inch or two across on the page of paper, and the, the nucleus is the size of maybe the, the eraser on your, your pencil, and then you have the, the uh, atoms, uh, the electrons orbiting. But the actual reality is, is far different in that the, the nucleus of an atom now, they know if it's the size of a pinhead, that the first electron shell is something like 10 kilometers away. You know, it's like, it's just mostly space. space. And yet it's all held together through these different fields, energetic um, relationships. And, um, but the fact is that all of this stuff that we take to be so real and so tangible is mostly just space. And so, yeah, I had that experience sitting on that surfboard. And then a little bit later, um, in uh, June of 1970, just after a very, very uh, important uh, transitional time, I just graduated high school. And the whole, my whole future was sort of pivoting before me. And I had this huge experience that lasted about 14 hours. And that is when it just burst open. And I mean, a lot of people would say, he had a 14-hour experience of Satori or some kind of enlightenment. It was, 
My wife sometimes said, I think it might have also been your future self who is sort of penetrating through the you know, illusion of time and telling you something about what was to come. But anyway, I, I said, I'm definitely going to be involved in some kind of spiritual awakening throughout my life. That's going to be the, the main thrust of my life. It will be a, an enlightenment, enlightenment orientation in my life. But it went on for about 14 hours, and it just said, that's it. And from that point on, I went into a totally different direction than what you might consider to be, you know, an ordinary life. So, what, um, from our conversations, it seems, I gathered that for a number of years, you made a concerted effort to see your life as a waking dream. And yeah. do, you, do you continue that practice now? And if so, do you do it consciously or automatically now? Um, I do it both. It happens both consciously and automatically. But there are all there is that whole aspect of synchronicity, you know, the Jungian term, which is you know. Well, I was going to ask. I was going to ask you about that. It, uh, that you know, synchronicity appears to play a major role in mythic structure, and and Jung called these events whispers of the soul, right? So, do you, mm. do you agree with Jung's categorization of synchronicity? As whispers of the soul? Oh, yeah, I believe that. When, when you start having these series of synchronicities, for me, it is, I say, yes, I'm on, I'm on track here. I'm, everything is, I, it's getting more and more now for me. I, I mean, I've been doing this uh, going on 20 years now. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting more and more like everything that's occurring in synchronicity, where it, it, yeah. there are punctuations. Uh, where there are really distinct, prominent, like kaboom moments, where you go, wow, that's a really, um, but even is all that happening to things. you daily, weekly, monthly kind of thing, or it's just you know so much? Well, alive. definitely da daily. It's a, it's happening daily, um, and then it's punctuated weekly by more uh, pronounced um, um, things that unfold. Um, and you, you, but, you give it, you attribute it to, you see it in certain aspects, how you might look at it uh, differently than you normally, you know, would by bringing a consciousness, a conscious awareness to what's happening. Well, well, Jung refers to it as an a-causal connecting principle, and where you see things are connected that are not necessarily connected causally. And you think of causation, you think of Newtonian physics, you think of billiard balls, Ball A hits ball B that hits ball C, and um, and that's all tied up in our ideas of time. And time is to me, there is no time. When you get when people enter the underworld, when people go in search of their golden fleece and drop down that's deep the within second, themselves. That's the second part of the mythic journey broken down. That goes yeah. into the underworld. Yeah, so when that's, people go into the underworld, yeah. what were you saying? Th there's no time there. There isn't there's any time. time. And you see that time is just a a convenient structure that we can kind of put things into relationship with one another, but that the only time there is is right now. But when people are, when we're kind of trapped in that, you know, past, present, future, there really is no present. You know, like this, the popularity of this idea of the power of now. Yeah. Well, people, you can't live in the now and live in that artificial structure of past, present, future. That present is never present. It's always just the moment past, and we're reflecting on it in as a memory, you know, a moment ago. So, um, in, in, in that underworld experience, when people turn within or they, um, they enter into the, what I call the primacy of consciousness, there, there's no time. But, the whole idea of a mythic structure is that things are sequential and there is this sort of thing that unfolds in a meaningful way. But I see it, um, the, the idea of uh, synchronicity is that, well, there is this kind of meaningful connection that, that blurs the distinctions between what's outside and what's inside. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll tell you a story. Good, okay. When... Uh, Back in the 90s, as I was really getting into this stuff more and more intensely, both my wife and I were, um, one incident, just to give an idea of this blurring of the, the subjective and objective realms, I used to tell bedtime stories to my children, especially my two youngest children at the time, who were sort of like uh, six and eight years old. 
my youngest son and my only daughter. And I would tell them a lot of stories about my home in Virginia Beach, Virginia, the house that was built because I was going to be born. They had a three-bedroom home. I thought they thought we better have let's get another home, better location. Let's build a four-bedroom home. So we have three children. One anyway. They built this home since I was being born. I had a lot of my early experiences up to uh, age 11 in that house. So many of the really intense, you know, formative years when you think about the personality structure. And Uh, here in Australia, we had so I had my children had a lot of exposure to all these stories, and I was in a lot of uh, deep process work in resolving and healing a lot of my the childhood wounds that had occurred in that house. Mm-hmm. And we visited the U.S. shortly after my father's death back in, the, I think, about 1970, uh, 1997. And we took a side trip to Virginia Beach, and we went into the old neighborhood, and there was the old house. And they had, like, painters' trucks, and it's like they were doing renovation. My wife said, look, just go knock on the door, go inside and see if they'll let you take a look. So I went up there, they said, come on through. So here, my wife and four of our children, we went through the house looking at all. The initials were still carved in my desk, you know, and there's the closet when things would get really heavy. I'd go in this little closet, shut the door and like sort of hide out. And um, went through the whole thing. It was very, very powerful, very emotionally moving. Walked down to the back, to the bay in the back and just looked, and it was... um, autumn so the, the geese were flying over it was kind of misty and I just felt I, I was crying and I just said wow I feel like such deep completion has taken place here and I feel like this I, I'm, I'm co- complete with this whole big aspect of my childhood a, a day or so later I wrote a poem about it I completed the poem with a type of I don't know it's verbatim but it's something like the old house has fallen fast asleep and re-entered the mind of God. That was sort of the conclusion of the poem. A day or two later, we've flown back to Australia, and I get a phone call from my mother. She said, Rick, you won't believe what's happened. You know, Kitty, her friend in that neighborhood, best friend, she had driven by the house a day or so before. She calls my mother and says, Anne, you won't believe it. Your house, the old house, it's completely gone. That whole, the, the land where the house was, I don't know, whatever had happened, they decided, let forget about renovating, let's tear the, whatever happened, that house wow, was no gone. longer existing. Within days of you in, visiting it and feeling that healing. Days, wow. Yeah, and yeah, and feeling that healing and really feeling deep completion about that aspect of my childhood. So in that way, I was, this is kind of like bleed through where you feel that the inner and the outer are so intimately connected and there's not this big giant division, this is subjective, this is objective, it's a, I, I feel that uh, the primacy of consciousness really allows there to be a very uh, profound connection between the inner and the outer, therefore this idea of stuff happening in a meaningful way in the outside, which is Jung called synchronicity, um, it just, I, I'm just seeing everything as synchronicity, as, you, as I'm living from this structure, life as a waking dream. I'm dreaming this right now. I'm dreaming it. Let me become conscious. And being conscious that we're dreaming, so I'm lucidly living life as a waking dream. Wow. That far away from being wide awake. And that's lucidly, like the whole thing with the Buddha. Lucidly living the waking dream and being this far away from wide awake. Beautiful, Richard. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> what amazing uh, vision there. That's it's nice. really fun. <laughs> wow, okay. So I really tell all my clients, I offer, the, I offer the idea. I don't tell anyone what to do or believe, but I offer my clients the idea that a life could be lived that way. How, what do you think that would be like? Um, because everyone really needs to find their own way. That's what I believe. Everyone is on their own kind of path and yeah. let, it, let it unfold accordingly. But I do like the way Campbell sort of summarized. And, you know, he's the one who said that dreams are private myths mm-hmm. and myths are public dreams. Yes. But he did find that correspondence between us, between all the great, you know, spiritual and religious yes. traditions. The yes. correspondence, the hero seems to be cropping up. The same basic, he, he breaks it down into much greater detail as right. you read through that book. But uh, those three components are there for the hero. 
So, you know. so good. So um, thinking of it as a waking dream, we can become more empowered to live as the choose to go post narrative or develop the narrative as mm -hmm. the hero Make or choices. heroine of our yep. dream. Yeah, um, we have that. As, as conscious beings, we seem to have the power to the make power choices. To do that. Yes. Uh, oh, and then what started happening for me was this very, um, very strong orientation that began unfolding to live life as a waking dream from the heart. And that's how you and I contacted, because I saw an article that you had written in the Elephant Journal about chai tea, but I, I read some little other subtext in there about you and about what you were doing about you know, uh, little ways of being and living from the heart. I said, I'm contacting this person, and it's, and it's going to be important. And also that we both have some connection to a spiritual tradition that's yes. similar. And uh, so that was really important. And then very little details about your life, which I won't go into now, which really struck me in a very <laughs> profound, meaningful way. But yeah. can I tell another story about just well, how we that? have we, Yes. How do we have time? Yeah, let's, let's uh, hear one more story and then we'll say goodbye for the day. Okay, well this was a story that happened. Uh, in a very say, symbolically mean. So if I look out the world, I'm I'm reading symbols. Now Phoebe, the character on Friends, <laughs> she used to do this uh, in very extreme, very you know. Anyone who knows that character on Friends, she was this sort of the sort of the zany blonde who's kind of hippie, new agey. So you can take this to a very extreme, extreme. ways and read a little minute, every minute little thing you can sort of read that way. But anyway, this is um, a very poignant uh, moment in time, in history really, because um, this occurred for my wife and I were, this is in Noosa, in Australia. So first of all, what do they call Australia? The land down under, right? Yeah. So I, I perceive it, I've been living uh, for the last 22 or 23 years in the land down under, aka the underworld. That's how I would interpret it. If I was dreaming it, I was having a dream, and in the dream I'd move to Australia. Australia, right? Oh, that's, that's very, very interesting, you know, as you're being psychoanalyzed, you know, your dream is being interpreted by some Freudian or Jungian, right? So we're in the down underland, the underworld, in a place that a beautiful destination resort area called Noosa. Now, in the Aboriginal dialect, Noosa means the place of shadow. And this is exactly what I've been doing for like some 20 years, was intense shadow work and really looking at all those places of my repressed feelings, my repressed feeling nature, um, um, my wounds, my sacred wounds, all that stuff. So Noosa, place of shadows in the underworld, um, and it is the winter solstice, the last one of the millennium. So a hugely pivotal time, symbolically speaking, um, you know, they, they, Christmas has sometimes been said, they placed it on the winter solstice even though if Jesus, Jesus wasn't born then, but it's such a powerful time, a time of it's the renewal time, time of new beginnings when now the sun is starting to come back uh, into a more, you know, northerly course or whatever, southerly course, depends on your hemisphere. So, winter solstice, sunrise, and on this particular morning, we're walking just the two of us completely in the Noosa National Park, towards a place called the Boiling Pot, and the sky is this astounding mackerel sky. Now, you, you folks could Google this, you know, what is a mackerel sky? But it is a very fine, like the scales of a fish, it's the most astounding, beautiful sky. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning, and it's breathtaking. Literally, we go, oh my God, look at the sky, right? And so it was sunrise, so the sun, it's just come up over the horizon, and that whole mackerel sky, the sky was illuminated gold, and pink. And as we're walking down the trail, completely quiet, windless, we look up through the trees. We're sort of like called, like, look up through the trees, the breaks in the trees. And in behind the trees in the gaps, we see this hole, this perfect circle has been punched out like a giant cosmic cookie cutter has cut this thing out, perfectly round. And the, the cloud substance that had been cut out it forms right before our eyes into a perfect heart, white heart. This azure blue background, you know, that brilliant deep blue that comes. And it's not like 
Mm, I guess it could be like a heart. You know, it's not. It was so perfect and unmistakable, like right off of Valentine's card. White heart, circle, blue background, right? And we're going, holy smoke, look at this. Now, we've been already, by that time, living life as a waking dream for about five solid years at least. And so we're both very aware, like, something's happening here, right? You know, be attentive, be alert, be lucid. Be So we just walked, we continued walking to east again, symbolically, powerful sort of direction to be moving towards the newly risen sun, again, powerful symbolism, and this whole cloud mass is drifting towards the sun. And as we get to this spot, now, the spot is called the Boiling Pot. Anyone who ever visits Noosa National Park, you can go there. It's a, a, ge a geological feature, uh, like a tunnel under some a rock formation, and then waves crash, they break through, they push through that tunnel, and then there's this, like, pot, like, it really looks like a heart. It is shaped like exactly like a heart, but they call it a pot. And water goes in there, and it's like a boiling pot is how they saw it. But if you go there, you look down, you'll see it's shaped like a heart. So we get to that spot. So simultaneously to the second, we get to that spot, we stop, we look up, the cloud mass is drifted over, and that heart at that precise moment in time at the boiling pot, looking up, that heart eclipses the sun and then dissolves right before our eyes. And we know uh, uh, what kind of references can we make? I mean, you know, have the whole connection, like the famous or infamous uh, sacrificing of hearts to the sun by the Aztecs and various, you know, uh, Central American uh, tribal cultures. Um, it's such a powerful, there's such symbolism. I, I still don't have the full, uh, say, analysis of all, what it all meant. But one thing it did mean to me was, here it is, Richard. Here's your focus. Uh, focus on living your life as a waking dream, but from your heart. your heart. And then that heart, as that heart, the heart and the sun both are afloat in that blue, that, that beautiful blue. And that is, that's, if you can see it, that's right here. That is the fifth chakra. That is the communication. Speak about this stuff. Just start talking about it. Just start talking about it. And that is that's been what I've been doing. So 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 in in mythic story or the mono myth that you described with Campbell's, this is you coming back from the underworld or coming back from going down under and coming with your gift and now you're going to be giving it. You're now you're being asked exactly. to give it to the world. Speak it. Exactly. Hands it out. That's, what, that's exactly yeah, very, yeah, very astute there. Uh, yeah, I really feel like I have, I'm just moving out of the underworld. I'm moving out again into the world. I'm in a, right now I'm working at a health retreat where I'm, I'm this is coming out now more and more and more with the, not only a steady flow of clients, but I'm also speaking regularly to groups of people and this sort of thing, which is why I so much like what I saw on Facebook a few months ago, because in a beautiful, succinct, little expression, I would probably call it steps two and three in the monomyth. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. And right now, that is what I'm involved in doing is giving, 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 giving. And not everyone has that, I believe. I deeply believe it now. And, and my, how, how satisfying it is to come from that place of selfless love, giving, and... Um, what yeah. you get back is so unbounded. Because we are living now, if we're, we're living in a very uh, desperate world. We, we are in a, a time where the world needs us. It needs awakened or awakening human beings who have found their there gift. There are and many, who are, many, many. There are many. As you, uh, as you just uh, open, as we open our eyes to the prospect or the po possibility, what I believe, the probability that thousands and thousands, probably millions of human beings are waking up right now. As you look for it, you see it. A lot of it flies under the radar and we don't necessarily see it in the media, although now more and more with the World Wide Web, we can find it all over the place if we open yeah. our eyes to it. That's what I Very thought. exciting time. Yeah, very exciting very time. Wow. Thank you so much, Richard. That's that's so much to think about. We're going to 
probably have to do another have another discussion that uh, can go pretty deep yeah we're just scratching the surface, scratching the surface. So much that's what i get the impression but, of. But here we are, we're doing this, you and me are doing this, and yes. this is coming out of both of our our calling, you know, to connect to the heart, to be hearts, and to connect with others of a like disposition, I'll say. Yeah. Like-minded, but, like-hearted, but like-hearted also. Like-hearted and yeah. um, to encourage more of an awareness about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to make it a better world. Thanks for, for doing that with us today, Richard. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really fun to do it. Good. And so when we meet again, have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.